Alexander of Macedon by Harold Lamb continues. Roxana in part three. For a long time, no one dared to go near him, nor would he send her food or drink. When Anaxarchus, frightened by his silence, went in with Aristander the next day, they found Alexander sitting in the robe he had worn at supper, his eyes inflamed as if he had been weeping. They brought in water and food, to which he paid no attention. Alexandros ventured to speak, saying that all things happened by the will of the entities, not by human will. Well, humans can choose among the circumstances that they've been provided, right? And so had the death of Clytus occurred. Alexandros looked up. Lanis had no sons. Now she has no brother. There was a woman at Thebes. Anaxarchus struck his hands together sharply. Alexandros, king of the Macedonians and lord of Asia, he said in a sharp voice to the old diviner, sits there crying like a slave. The caustic, natural voice cut through Alexandros's self-torment, and after a while he went to sleep, his head drooping over his arms, locked together as if holding desperately to support. When a man is most alone, he holds most closely to myth during spells or deep depression, like one following the slaying of Black Clytus. Alexandros felt an overpowering sense of guilt. He had murdered those who had been closest to him. He had torn down and burnt Thebes. It was not so much an obsession as it was the phantasmagoria of violence and death that tortured his imagination. At such times he saw himself and his actions, not in a blur of self-pity, but in the terrible clarity of memory. When these ghosts of the past marched on him and overcame him, his mind could not summon up a defense. Drinking brought no nepenthe. At such time the souls of Rushanak and Hephaestion could not stand between him and the phantasmagoria. He was, as Aristotle had seen, alone, some understanding of, Alex of Alexandros's self-torment is apparent in the dry words of the Roman Arian, who was a Stoic. I do not think it strange that Alexandros committed great errors, either from impetu impetuity or from wrath. He was young, and he had risen to the height by the impulse of fortune. Nor is it strange that he was led to conduct himself, like the Persian kings, immoderately. As for the associates he grouped around him, kings always have such associates, and such associates will always work on them to do wrong, without thought of their vital interest. But I am certain Alexandros was the only one of the ancient kings to repent so greatly of the wrongs he did. Most men, then as now, when they have committed a sin, make the mistake of concealing it by defending it as a just action. Alexandros was singular in not doing so. Arian is apologizing here, as a Stoic, but he has caught the significance of something strange in Alexandros's self-abasement. Apparently, Alexandros did not feel that ritual sacrifice could wipe out the blood stain that lay upon him. The two lambs that had been, anointed, that had been anointed by Black Clytus were sacrificed afterwards as planned, only to Dionysus, the hero, not to the sons of Zeus. Well, perhaps they've divinized individuals, and the so-called sons of Zeus were other heroes. By this time, also, he'd given up hope of finding the way to the lost paradise of the Iranians, to the Iranvenge, the height in the northeast corner of the Oikomena, from with which Karush had set out. He had backtracked Karush as far as Marakand, where Clytus was probably killed. Now he was crossing the Parapinasatis without discovering anything more remarkable than ranges of extremely high mountains populated by barbaric folk. At the same time, he was enlarging his concept of the Oikomena, it stretched further east than his geographers had supposed, up at the northernmost, Alexandria, where the new town of Leninabad 
may stand today under the Aleski Krebet range. He had heard Scythians tell of a land unknown to the Greeks. Sin art sin beyond the steppes, and he knew not and he knew now that the river Indus lay long marches east of the Parapanisadis passes. But what lay beyond Sin and the great valley of the Indus? There must be the limit of the Oikomena, the edge of the Eurasian continent, ocean itself. There also might be found the mysterious source of the great river Nile and the Indus. Greek myth assured him that from the springs of the sun in the utmost east flows the river at the up to empty into the cataracts of the Nile. For neither Alexandros nor his surveyors knew the shape of the landmass south and east of him under the Pleiades. Aristotle had believed that the mass of land in the south stretched from southern Egypt to India and that the Nile actually had its source close to the Indus. In this limbo at the farthest east, the Macedonians, of course, had seen for themselves, some of them, the northern tips of the Red Sea and the Persian Sea, but they did not know as yet whether these were arms of the outer encircling ocean or inland seas. Alexandros suspected that they were arms of the great ocean, but most of the men believed them to be inland waters. If that was the case, the land must extend all the way, from the upper Nile to the Indus. Probably the Nile itself dipped under the surface of the earth to reappear in Egypt. They had heard much talk in Greece of such subterranean waters that might reach to Hades. There was the Styx, for example. Some truth, some, you know, issues expressing things, obviously. Meanwhile, one argument had been settled Everyone agreed now that they could not be near the Fetid Sea and the Tanais, the Sea of Azov, and the Don, a point from which they might return easily to Mastodon by a short circle to the east, following the course of the Argonauts. Every phalanx veteran had marched over too much ground towards the rising sun for that. They knew they were exploring unknown territory beyond the Caspian, far east of Babylon, the geographers reached a compromise about the actual shape of the earth. Now they assumed the straight line of the Taurus Mountains stretched due east, running south of the Caspian, to meet the mightier barrier range of the Parapanisades. But what lay beyond this barrier, they did not know, except that the river Indus was to be met there. Calisthenes told them that the land around the Indus formed only a small peninsula, stretching to a point out into the ocean itself. So one thing appeared certain to Alexandros. No matter what might be found upon earth in this next stage to the east, he would very soon reach the end of earth itself and stand upon the dark shore of ocean with all mysteries resolved and all doubts set to rest. Towards the shore of ocean, he determined to make his way. To encourage the armies, he reminded them, embroidering fables, in so doing, that the heroes, Heracles and Dionysus, had both penetrated to this eastern limit and had won glory and satisfaction by so doing. They would journey where Heracles and Dionysus alone had gone before them to gain immortal life. Naturally, some of the Macedonian faction retorted, when they heard this, that only those who were immortals could hope to get as far as that. These Macedonians disliked intensely the contingent of Persian immortals who were kept at headquarters and sometimes did guard duty. Really, archers, instead of... Oh, this is a couple pages longer than... This chapter is a couple pages longer than I thought. Instead of spearmen, the Persian immortals were called golden apple spearmen by the Westerners because their weapons had gilt balls below the iron points. Now cavalry units of Bactrians and Scythians also appeared at the mobilization in the early spring of 327 BCE. Even Alexandros felt dubious 
But the multitude that poured into the camps, soothsayers, priests, and money changers, had added their establishments to the military. The soldiers now had more women to follow them, and the women had more children. The armies had become moving colonies. And, as for the baggage... After his first inspection of the columns of pack animals and carts, Alexandros lectured the men on the sin of multiplying possessions and proceeded to burn the bulkier portions. The veterans caught the contention of reducing weight by fire and set the torch to other mountains of baggage until the roads became chains of bonfires and the camps seethed like broken hives. Are you still to learn, Alexandros cried at the veterans, that you must win victories without taking on the infirmities of the people you subdue? He had set the example of discarding all impediments except field equipment. One high officer, Harpalus, the treasurer, is the name given in the chronicles, but Harpalus seems to have remained at Babylon and Ecbatana. He suspected, he suspected of concealing a great store of gold and silver bullions and chests within his field pavilion. This the officer denied emphatically, and after the denial, Alexandros was not willing to have the man's belongings searched. For these commanding officers were still in the main freeborn Macedonians, nobles and members of the National Council. He had increased their authority and wealth without making any change in their rights as individuals and Macedonian nobles, thereby creating a dangerous anomaly of which his mother, Olympias, had warned him, and still warned him by letter. This difficulty Alexandros solved as swiftly as he always met dilemmas. He ordered some of his personal guards to set fire to the pavilion of the offending officer during the baggage burning. If the big tent began to burn, he thought the servants would haul out the chests of valuables, the first thing, thereby disclosing the treasure. As it turned out, the fire did its work too well. Hangings, precious garments, perfumes, jewels, and bullion all went up, and the conflagration. The treasure had indeed been hidden there, but no one could prove it. Ruefully, Alexandros paid the officer damages out of his own account. Well... They sifted through the ashes, couldn't they have figured some of that out? Um, although the field armies had grown, the number of experienced Macedonian officers of the companion type had diminished inevitably because most of them had been left behind to govern. With their Asiatic opposite numbers, the vast terrain already taken over, a commander of taxis might be the military governor of a city or countryside of a half million souls. Alexandros had insisted on this dual control. The embryo Eurasian state would have no dominating cult or nation. Even the military control would not be overriding because it had no authority over public funds, and such funds were to be used in the main for development projects, which included, of course, building Greek-type theaters and academies, as well as new high roads. Through the mountain regions, they had explored new hospitals, fleets, ports. Nothing in all this was agreeable to the veteran Macedonian officers. They disliked the necessity of getting the signature, the seal stamp, of an Asiatic official to a decree, or begging an Egyptian or Semitic treasurer for ration money. The very names of the Asiatic seemed ridiculous. Why should a man call himself Lord of Rivers, or Son of the Truth, or Radiant One? And, as for the cylindrical seals they carried, the Macedonians were very skeptical, skeptical about the consequences of marking documents with the sign of the half-moon, or the image of the Lady of Beasts, or even the popular winged head. No good, they thought, would come of that. Now, well, there's different cultures, so what? Um, but it used to be that wherever you went, names meant something. So what are these Greek names? Um, it would help if he was telling us what the Greek names were supposed to mean. Alexandros still tried to carry on the ever-increasing labor of administration alone. When an officer fell sick, he wrote to demand why he had not been informed of it. When someone married an Asiatic woman, he sent a gift and a note of approval. 
He had let it be known that such marriages found great favor with him. His new officials realized that there was no longer council or court of appeal other than Alexandros's personal decision. And when the king disappeared off the map, as he did at this point by crossing the Parapanisades, this decision was hard to obtain. Very naturally, the authors asked themselves, what if he never comes back after the risks and hardships of Bactria and Solid? The odds seemed to lie heavily against his coming back from India. In consequence, most of the officer governors began to prepare for such a contingency by laying aside private fortunes and setting up the cells of kingdoms of their own. In this, the Macedonians sinned more than the Asiatics, who displayed great loyalty. Well, sin's making a mistake. If they don't consider it a mistake, it's not a sin. Uh, ancient Egyptian, you know, um, for mistake. Alexandros had won that loyalty at a price. He'd been amazingly quick to understand the working of the Asiatic mind. When meeting with Orientals, he claimed obedience, not as a Macedonian commander, but as a, but as a successor of Kurush, an instrument of divine authority. Inevitably, he began to wear Persian dress at such meetings. <coughs> Here, in farther Asia, the Macedonian riding dress, with its wide, soft hat, baggy riding trousers, and boots, are the Greek style with kilt, mantle, and sandals, marked a man as a barbarian or a soldier. It had become vitally important for Alexandros to keep not only the obedience, but the respect of the Asiatics. But the first time the veteran Macedonians beheld him seated on something like a throne with the awkward tiara in his head, on his head, they laughed. What kind of dressing up festival is this, Alexandros, they asked. That angered him. He used the gold couch at meals and kept incense burning around him because... Not to do so would puzzle and, be and bewilder the Asiatics. Before these noble-born Orientals, he could not conduct himself like a Yavana teamster. Only with an effort, he had managed to play the two parts successfully until now, to be at once the chosen king of freeborn Westerners who hated the despot and the Shahinashah of the Orientals who knew no rule other than despotism. These two parts clashed fatally when Orientals began to prostrate themselves on approaching him. Not to do so would have been inconceivable to the Easterners who beheld in the robed and enthroned Alexandros, the person invested with heavenly power. They covered their mouths with their hands. They bent to their knees, and when they came, when they came before him, this time the Macedonians did not laugh. Well, you know, no one's got that uh, Eve. I'm not going to bite you. Um, well, you're not going to spit on people either. Um, this time, the Macedonians did not laugh. Did not laugh. And it put an end to Callisthenes. This sophist, disciple of Aristotle, had rebuked Alexander Cross openly before now. Anaxarchus and other audulators, knowing that Callisthenes was writing a history of the Macedonians, whispered to Alexandros that the sophist had boasted that his history would make their lord renowned for all time. Actually, Callisthenes had said publicly that Alexandros was no god, no son of Zeus, born of Olympus, and that only Alexandros's actions throughout his life would establish his fame or ill fame. To Anaxarchus. The sophist may have said, Alexandros not only seems to be, but is one of the bravest of men, of kings, the most kingly of commanders, one of the most worthy.